holiness the dalai lama happiness is a state of mind by his holiness the 12th galwang drogpa the three teachings by zen summa tenzin palmo the here heartful path of awakening <clears throat> by kempo jamyang kama gaotsen so let us uh, put our palms together to introduce to welcome brother sharap wong uh, good morning everybody so first of all i would like to i will be the moderator today okay i try my best try to moderate this uh, this forum so called forum so first of all i would like to invite uh, uh submission mission and submission kamle to come to the stage so first uh, i would like to introduce uh, submission kamle submission kamle is uh, from maharashtra she completed her bachelor's degree in 2019 from nagarjuna training institute nagpur and masters in buddhist studies in abc thailand she is interested in studying various aspects of buddhist philosophy and is presently a phd candidate in ibc and then our next speaker will be uh, samisha mishram samisha mishram came from madhya pradesh she completed her bachelor's degree in 2019 as well from nagarjuna training institute nagpur and masters in buddhist studies from ibc thailand she is currently a phd candidate in the international buddhist college ipc thailand she likes to study various aspects of buddhist philosophy so these two uh, ladies here they have same name and they study also uh, in ibc so okay. so now i think first of all i would like to invite uh, samisha kamle to uh, give her sharing uh, by the title of introduction to yoga chara so during the process of sharing you can ask any question la you can just raise your hand and ask any question yeah well, first of all thank you so much for arranging all this and giving me the opportunity to share so uh, today what i'm going to present is uh, a very brief introduction of very complex philosophical system uh, i don't feel i'm a qualified person but uh, i would like to share what i have learned and my understanding um so uh, please forgive me if i make any mistake and uh, i don't claim that this is what yoga chara is it is my understanding of what yoga chara uh, philosophy is okay uh, and thank you so much for joining for uh sorry that we didn't prepare any slide because uh, we didn't know that that we have to do that so i'm really very sorry for that mm so uh, as the topic given to me was the introduction to yoga chara so let me start with the name itself yoga chara so we have two words there yoga and chara uh, so what i'm going to do is to give a very basic outline of what yoga chara philosophy is because i assume uh, many of uh, us do not like many of you do not have uh, an understanding of abhidharma and all so that was what uh, told to me so i'll just give a very brief outline and then um, if there is any question so we can go into the So yes let us start with the uh, name itself of the school which is yoga chara so as we see it is made up of two um words which is yoga and achara so yoga there means to apply oneself to something or to practice something so here specifically uh, like um, often it is referred to the practice of uh, meditation and achara also has more or less the same meaning of uh, practice so um now if we when we say that this school is named yoga chara so it doesn't mean that they were only the one who practices meditation so uh, probably it could be the case that uh, there is a larger compendium which was composed by uh, one of the pioneering philosopher of yoga chara school who is his asanga i'll tell you the story of asanga and vasubandhu uh, soon after this so he has composed a very uh, huge treatise called yoga chara bhumi shastra so probably it could be the fact that the school was named after this huge treatise um so um the two main figures or the pioneering figures in the which plays major role in the philosophy of yoga chara is asanga and vasubandhu they were half brothers uh, by which i mean to say that they were they comes from the same mother but they had different father 
So first, let me uh, like tell you a brief story about related to Asanga's life. He was a very uh, learned. He was a very learned. Uh, um, how to say scholar would not. I wouldn't say scholar, but he was a very learned uh, practitioner, a Buddhist philosopher. He had very comprehensive knowledge of uh, Buddhist sutras and shastras as well. Sutras means uh, which are declared as the words of Buddhas. In Pali, we call it sutta. In Sanskrit, we call it sutras. So he was very learned and he has very uh, comprehensive knowledge of Buddhist sutras as well as the shastras. Shastras are usually, uh, like it is translated as commentaries. So in uh, Pali also, we have various commentaries. So, um, but uh, there were a particular set of shastras which he was finding very challenging for himself, particularly the text of Prajna Parmita. So, and he felt like, okay, I need somebody now, an authoritative person who is, who could help me to understand this. So, and then uh, for that purpose, he meditated. He meditated for a very long period of time, which is for 12 years, in order to in order to um, like uh, meet somebody or, okay, maybe I should not put it like this, but in order to cultivate some meditation so that he could meet somebody, an authoritative figure who could help him to make understand this huge perfection of wisdom, sutras. And then um, during this period of 12 years, um, he was initially very disappointed because he couldn't see that he was making any sort of progress. So whenever he, get, he got disappointed and thought like, okay, now no more, I'm not going to practice anymore or I'm not going to continue my efforts anymore, then uh, somehow he encountered uh, something like such incidences which inspired him to keep on moving forwards and to keep on continuing his work. One such incidence was uh, he saw a man who was rubbing uh, an iron uh, with a cotton. So when he asked him, what are you doing? So he said, I'm making a needle. So he, was, he, he thought like, okay, if in a very um, small act of making a needle, this person is putting this amount of effort, so how can I give up where, I, where my purpose is to understand the highest Prajna Parmita Sutras. So, Prajna Parmita Sutras is considered to be that which gives us the ultimate meaning, ultimate nature, that which introduces us to the ultimate nature of the realities. So, uh, he thought, so that clicked to his mind that, okay, if somebody is putting in, putting this amount of effort in such a worldly task, Okay, I, sorry. So if somebody is putting uh, such great effort in such a worldly ta task, so I, it is, I cannot give up so easily. So as such, he maybe he encountered few more incidences when he got discour discouraged. So this encounter helped him to keep on moving forward with his practice. And after a period of 12 years, uh, he encountered a dog. So a dog who was wounded, uh, and there was, uh, and his wound was infested with some maggots. So he felt very compassionate for that dog and also for the maggots. So he thought if he will clean the wound with his hand, so he will harm the maggots. Maggots, you know, like some certain kinds of insect there. So, so he was compassionate also for the maggots and also for the dog. So he. So uh, the way he discovered to help them was he cut a piece of his, the flesh from his thigh and then he decided that, okay, he will uh, leak the maggot and then put those maggot on, the on his flesh. So uh, is it going okay? Uh, like, am I making sense to you? Is it fine? Okay. I hope I'm not making too bored. <laughs> so yeah, so we were on the story. So he thought, okay. So this is how uh, the way he discovered was, so this is how I can save the maggot as well as I can help the dog to cure his wound. Then um, as soon as he bent down to clean his wound through his tongue, the dog suddenly appeared as Buddha Maitriya, the future Buddha Maitriya. So then Asanga complained to him, 
oh i was meditating on you for so long how come why did you make you make me wait so long so this is what he complained to future buddha maitreya so the buddha maitreya said oh no i was always there it was you who lacked compassion that was that was why you were not able to see me and uh, then in order to prove this uh, maitreya buddha asked him okay you put me on your shoulder and just have a walk through the village so when he did so he found that like few people could see a dog on his shoulder few people could see some portion of his body and few people couldn't see anything so it was according to like the level of compassion and wisdom you have the level of merit you have so then uh, it was like maybe asanga was then convinced like that okay yeah it was me who didn't who lacked compassion then uh, now this we, we are introduced to two main figure of yoga chara philosophy which is uh, asanga and the second one is maitreya buddha then maitreya buddha as i've told you before that uh, asanga was having some issues understand okay maybe i'm using very like normal terms so uh he was not able to understand the perfection of wisdom sutras then uh buddha maitreya he gave him the teachings of perfection of wisdom sutras as well as then he explained him the five treatises the five great treatises which then becomes the basis for the yoga chara philosophy okay upon which considering this as the basic another text of yoga chara philosophies has uh, it came up or like they have uh, the other text of yoga chara philosophy have this as their foundations so this was the story of uh, the first figure which i mentioned which is asanga and uh, the second person is vasubandhu as i've said earlier he is the half brother of uh, asanga so vasubandhu uh, he was ordained in a sarvastivada lineage so what is sarvastivada my friend will tell you so he was uh, ordained in a sarvastivada lineage so he comes from there and um, so uh, i think he studied sarvastivada uh, about sarvastivada buddhism in kashmir and then okay i'm sorry maybe yeah. i'm very fast okay i'll try to speak slowly but in case uh, if anything you would like to ask me in between it's okay it's completely fine so yes we were on yeah sure i would not say that the, the yoga chara philosophy was founded by asanga but uh, yoga chara this way of interpretation of the sutras which are considered to be the buddha vachana like this was this was uh, taught by the buddha but this way of interpretation of of uh, how the yoga chara philosophers explain it it was uh, like this was um, it was asanga who asanga and vasubandhu and it came through maitreya buddha to them these teachings so it it okay maybe i'm making it confused i'm just looking at the reference uh, what you say the story about the the methods and all that this is the uh, reference to the text this text is uh, written by uh, founder of asanga actually what i'm saying what i just now said is the story of asanga okay then this one uh, when we are talking about yoga chara philosophy this yoga chara philosophy this makes the interpretation of the words of buddha in certain way actually those are the words of buddha and interpreting uh, this word in a certain way and this interpretation we have named it yoga chara philosophy so yoga chara like as i have explained you the name itself that it refers to the practice of meditation or applying oneself to something okay so this name he is given to them or probably it comes to it is given to their philosophy because uh, of the large treatises which was composed by asanga that 
is consider a Mahayanis kind of a, a part? Yes. All right, thanks. Mm. Okay. Uh, maybe we can tell it later. Okay. So, uh, in, when we talk about the Mahayana way of practice, so there we have two schools, two philosophical systems, according to which the way of Mahayana, the practice of Mahayana, could be accomplished. Like their aim is to attain for their aim is they aim at attaining Buddhahood. So, for practicing or for reaching that aim, there are two ways. Either you practice through the philosophical system of yoga Sara or you do it through the philosophical system of Madhyamika. Both of the school have are called as the Mahayana school uh, because they share a, a common aim. Although these two schools are quite different uh, in their philosophical um, orientation, like what they explain, what view of reality is, but. It is also not that black and white to say that they are completely different and like they are different or they are same because uh, it could be the case that one is leading to the other or it could also be the case that uh, one thing is, uh, sec the second thing is uh, the other way to look at the first thing. So it is never very black and white because what they have given to us in terms of huge treatises is what comes out from the the, they were, first of all, uh, bodhisattvas on higher bhumis. So it comes out of their experience of their cultivation and their meditation. And we are like, we, were, we can just assume according to our analysis where, and like we are nowhere to uh, uh, like make, uh, uh, how, how should I put it, make a clear, um, take a, like, very certainly decide whether this was this and this was that. At the best, we can, uh, based on a very thorough reasoning, we can decide, okay, this could be this, but we can, we can never be certain because that was, it comes, uh, like, they have given us, they came, up, came out of those shastras, out of their cultivation and their meditation. So it was the direct experience of how reality is. So, um, okay, so we were on the story of uh, Vasubandhu. So, yes, I've told you that Vasubandhu is, um, Vasubandhu was first ordained as a uh, Sarvasivada monk. But then uh, his brother Asanga, half brother Asanga, he convinced him of the Yoga Sara view, and then later he get convinced. And then he also, he also understand uh, the aspect or the philosophical perspective of Mahayana. And then he, uh, apart from, like, he has a huge contribution in not only um, a yoga, uh, the Mahayana schools, not only in the composition of huge treatises of Mahayana school, but also, but also non-Mahayana school. So when I talk about non-Mahayana, I specifically re refers to the school of Sarvastivada and Sautrantika. So uh, this school of Sarvastivada and Sautrantika, uh, we categorize them in, uh, the category of Shravakayana. So, these are those schools which aims at liberation. Okay? And uh, yeah, as I have told you, the Mahayana, they are, aim is, they are aiming at Buddhahood. Okay? So, uh, how liberation and Buddhahood is different, um, I... Uh, maybe uh, you all might have some idea of it, uh, but uh, if we go into that track, it would be a little different. So, now, having, give, having given you the... Um, a brief story of uh, their founder, the founder. So let me introduce you to the basic outline of uh, Yoga Sara philosophy. Am I still very fast? Should I slow down? It's okay. So uh, the Another name for Yoga Sara school is, uh, they are called as Vijnanavadi or uh, Chitta Matra. So a, a school which uphold that, what exists is just consciousness. Apart from that, over and above that, nothing exists and we cannot negate consciousness. So 
when we say that okay only consciousness exists and uh, nothing apart from that exists so they are referring to when they are talking about this part that nothing other than consciousness exists they are referring to the shavaka school and when they said that okay consciousness exists and we cannot negate that so when they are uh, making this point so they are referring to um, the madhyamika school which at the end like according to them uh, when we reach at the ultimate analysis even mind it doesn't exist so it is empty of intrinsic nature so uh, when we say it doesn't exist so uh, uh, please don't misunderstand it to be non existence so uh, yes as i've told you that it is a system which upholds that um, which upholds the reality of consciousness and uh, how is this consciousness it is free from the aspect of grasped and free from the aspect of the one who grasp what is grasped and the grasper okay mm. yes okay now when they say that says that what exists is only consciousness and we do not really need an external object for our consciousness to arise so uh, how do they do it they do it by the system of eight consciousness so usually in other type of uh, abhidharmic system we have a system of six consciousness i think you might all know that five sense consciousness plus one mind consciousness so apart from this six in yogachara school we have two more consciousness the one is uh, alay vijnana and the another one is klishto mano vijnana so this alay vijnana and klishto mano vijnana is a unique feature of only the yogachara philosophers or oh, sorry the yogachara school but uh, it doesn't mean that all types of yogachara philosopher um except this except the existence of ale vijnana and klishto mano vijnana there are few which are the follower of uh, logic uh, especially i think the system of dharmakirti and the ganaga they don't and they don't accept the existence of ale vijnana and klishto vijnana although they call themselves to be yogachara philosopher so uh, let us see what is this alay vijnana so alay the term means store and it also have two other meaning but uh, let us just stick to this meaning of alay which is storehouse consciousness it is translated mostly in english as storehouse consciousness so uh, what does it store so it stores the uh, seeds of karma and two type of grasping so what are the two types of grasping it is the grasping of object of perception and the grasping at agent of perception so okay uh, we will go more into what is object and object of perception and agent of perception because uh, yes this is maybe this is alien to you all and okay this is a, a consciousness which continues without a, without gaps until one has attained liberation so uh, are you all uh, like have any slight idea of uh, what bhavanga chitta is in uh, theravada theravada abhidharma like there is an understanding of there is a uh, bhavanga chitta which yes okay maybe you have some slight, slight understanding of bhavanga chitta so it is on the basis of bhavanga chitta uh, that the theravada abhidharma explains continuity 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 from one life to to another lifetime okay because other type of consciousness like we do not have all the types of consciousness at all time okay we can explain it in terms of uh when we have sometimes we have i consciousness some okay we have uh alteration of our sense consciousness and our mind consciousness it seems as if it exists for all the time but uh we have certain stages when we are in deep asleep when even our mind consciousness doesn't seems to function as well as uh, we have certain other the cases when uh, for example we are fainted or uh, say for example we are in a state of coma so these are the cases when even our mind consciousness doesn't function so according to theravada my understanding of what theravada abhidharma is so during this period of time our uh, consciousness lapses into something called bhavanga so bhavanga chitta is also a kind of chitta Uh, actually this is not a special kind of chitta so it is a function which is performed by chitta so when our 
six perception uh, sorry six consciousness among which the five are sensory consciousness and the sixth one is the mind consciousness when they are not performing any functions or with then when they seems to be not functioning so our consciousness laps into bhavanga okay so the consciousness bhavanga is playing fun, like uh, the consciousness is functioning mm, okay maybe this is not a proper way to put it so just for the uh, like to make it easy our consciousness laps into bhavanga um, i'm sorry if like this is not the proper way to put it but uh, for sure to explain the continuity when there is when we are not aware of the external world so this is the factor which is used by theravada abhidharma so to explain continuity is a very is a huge point because uh, we are buddhist as a buddhist we explain in the doctrine of we accept the doctrine of anatma so anatma means there is no self so when there is no self we need to have some some um, uh we need to have something so that we could account for our karma like okay if there is no self how are we giving to give our accounts of karma if there is no self i i can do anything how how is it that we are going to get the result of what we are doing when there is no self so when we are rejecting the idea of self we need to have something on the basis of we on the basis of which we account the theory of karma okay so here uh yogachara philosopher they accept the existence of alay vijnana so as i have told you the alay vijnana is something which contains all the seeds and how is this alay vijnana is it is a it is not something which is constant but it is a continuum of consciousness means it is also momentary it is also created by causes and conditions so the causes and conditions for creating alay vijnana is also karma is also karma and then this is the main cause and as we uh, know with a very famous example of seed that the seed itself is not a, like not enough not capable of uh, producing a plant but it also needed certain conditions around like sunlight water and all so karma with the two fold grasping grasping of uh, grasping of agent of perception and as well as there is a perceiver which is perceiving it so this is what which q rise to the continuum of consciousness which is alay vijnana so uh, we cannot mistake it to be a self self means something which constantly stays and which is which stays as it is so alay vijnana is not that it doesn't stay at, as it is it is a continuum of consciousness which is created through causes and conditions and it is momentary so this is how we we provided uh, like like we solved the problem of okay we do not explain we do not accept any self but still we have a solution for the theory of karma mm, how much time do i have yeah, like 10 minutes okay 10 minutes so uh, among the eight consciousness we have solved one which is klesht, which is alay vijnana i'm sorry if i have not made you clear but okay we have done with one which is alay vijnana then the second one is klesht mano vijnana now this klesht mano vijnana is also a, is also unique to yogachara philosopher so where does this come from it comes from the seeds which is present in the alay vijnana as i have told you earlier alay vijnana is a store storage of seeds seeds of karmas and two fold grasping so the klishto mano vijnana arises from the seeds which is stored in the alay vijnana and it is called klishta klishta means uh, it is afflicted it is afflicted because it misperceives alay vijnana to be self and it has it always have four kinds of afflictions uh, present with it which is um, like weave of self assumption of self delusion towards self and uh, there is one more which is not coming to my mind right now so it is something which is which is which comes out from the imprints of Al- sorry which uh, yes which comes out from the seeds which are present in the alay vijnana and then the remaining six consciousness is what which is common to every school of abhidharma which is our five sense consciousness and the sixth one is the mind consciousness so uh, one more unique feature of yoga yogachara abhidharma is um, the different abhidharma school like all the abhidharma school except yogachara except that consciousness like not no two consciousness can exist at a, at one time okay so if 
uh, for example, if your eye consciousness is functioning, so at a moment only eye consciousness will function and then the second consciousness will arise. But uh, the unique feature of Yogacara Abhidharma is, according to them, any number of consciousness can arise at, in, uh, at a given moment. So, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. As I've told you, the Klishtomano Vijnana, it arises from Ale Vijnana. The same is for the sixth Nada consciousness. Okay? So, they also arises from the Ale Vijnana. Eight consciousness, huh? Eight consciousness uh, yes. it just comes to my mind that I think the Vajrayana uh, tradition, uh, Tibetan uh, practice, emphasize, emphasize a lot about this eight consciousness. Am I am I right about that? Uh, I'm sorry, I I I do not have much knowledge about Vajrayana, uh, so I cannot comment. Uh, just when talk about the uh -huh. eight consciousness, yes, uh, just I I just comes to my mind that the Vajrayana. The Tibetan Buddhism, they emphasize a lot on, on this eight consciousness. Alanyana conscious. Uh, sorry, I, I really sure. do not have much knowledge about Vajrayana. <laughs> you aware? Uh, uh -huh. the, 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 uh, What's your question uh, Vajrayana, again? they What's your question? emphasize a mm -hmm. lot about the... Uh, if I do recall, I heard I heard talks which they emphasize a lot about the eight consciousness. Mm, not particularly, no. yeah, not particularly. But uh, yeah, in certain texts or in certain practices, we do emphasize a lot of uh, the function of the eight consciousness. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks. Mm, yeah. Okay, so uh, when. As uh, like I have mentioned for Ale Vignana, that it continues until liberation. So uh, regarding the case of Klishto Mano Vignana, it also continues until liberation, but it has some gaps. That when uh, somebody is in uh, Lokottara Marga, when he has attained a certain stage, a certain stage uh, in terms of where he could see the reality, is not liberated, but a certain stage, a lokotar marga. When we say that, when we he, when he is, he could see uh, not an intellectual understanding of what four noble truth or what selflessness is, but he could perceive it. Okay, he could experience it at that level because that level is antidote to afflictions. Okay, so because klishto mano vijnana is something which is afflicted, so it cannot present in a state of mind where which is antidote to afflictions, where one could see reality as it is. So, uh, as see for Ale Vignana for storehouse consciousness, there is no gap. It will continue throughout until one attained liberation. But for Klishto Mano Vignana, the afflicted mind consciousness, it has some gap because it is something which is which has affliction with it. Okay, namely the four afflictions. So when somebody is an, in Lokottara Marga, and when somebody, uh, I think there is just one case. Yes, two cases. When somebody is in Nirodha Samapatti and when somebody is in Lokottara Marga. In these two cases, Ale Vijnana ceases. It doesn't exist. And then later, when somebody comes out of this meditative absorption, this Aklishto Mano Vijnana once again arises from the Ale Vijnana. Yes, so uh, I will conclude with two more points. So, uh, um, okay, so uh, when we are saying that cognition only, or which means mind only, according to Yoga Zara philosopher, they are saying that this is according to them to accept reality as mind only is the middle way. And what are the two extremes which they are negating? So if they are, they have, they come about, come up with the idea that okay, this is my middle way. So what are these extremes which they are negating? The first one is uh, I also mentioned it, it, it in the beginning. The extreme that the external object exists. For example, when we are saying in uh, for uh, in Shavaka Abhidharma, 
like the Abhidharma of Sarvastivada, Sautrantika, and also Theravada, when we uh, explain the arising of consciousness, so it needs an external object, it needs a uh, functioning eye faculty, and then on the basis of this two, eye consciousness comes about. So if you do not have a, like, a proper chakshu, chakshu means eye, your eye faculty is not functioning properly, so you cannot see. So on the other, and also that if there is nothing to be seen, you cannot see, the eye consciousness will not arise. So the necessary conditions for eye consciousness to arise is you need to have something to see, and you also need a proper functioning eye. But according to yoga Zara philosophers, no, it is not needed. If you are saying that, okay, there is something external for your consciousness to arise, you are mistaken. Your view of reality is mistaken. This is not so, okay? So why do this, uh, they, like they give many exam many reasons for why we cannot prove this external uh, object to, uh, to be really there. This is one extreme according to them, to consider that external object exists. Or uh, the category of dharmas, like the category of dharmas, uh, um, we all know about five skandhas, right? So five skandhas, it includes when we, categorize them or, or when we list the five skandhas so which we list into rupa skandha rupa vedna sangya samskara and vijnana so in theravada vidharma when we uh, like come up come up with the subdivisions or, or the classification of this we come to a total of maybe 72 so this 72 dharmas according to Sha, uh, theravada school in shavakayana and uh, we have also a list of 71 dharmas in Sar Sarvastivada and maybe a list of dharmas existing in Sautrantika also. So according to this, all these schools, these dharmas, they are, this is what really exists. Means you have got to an analysis of the reality up to the dharmas and then according to these schools, these dharmas, which means when we talk about Rupa, so Rupa includes the four great elements, okay? So according to these schools, um, this is what, up to which we could take our analysis. So according to Shravakayana, by which I mean the Theravada school as well as the Sarvastivada and Sautrantika school, according to this, the at the most we could take our analysis to these dharmas, to these dharmas of uh, 72, like which includes the categorization or all the classification of the five skandhas, when we come to Sarvastivada and Yoga Sara, they see it in terms of Panchavastu. So never mind. This dharmas is the like last level. We cannot take our analysis beyond that. But according to Yoga Sara school, okay. They according to them, if you are seeing this dharmas to be ultimately existing, that according to them it is an extreme. Okay, you are attributing a quality to some, uh, to attributing a quality to dharma which it doesn't have. They do not exist ultimately. And the second extreme is the Nada Madhyamika school, which according to, they do not ultimately exist, they, they do not uphold the ultimate existence of mind. According to Madhyamika philosophy, for them, as you have analyzed the dharmas, and you are saying that, okay, this does not exist really because we could analyze it furthermore. Similarly, for the mother, because we could analyze, we could apply the same analysis for the mind. But for Yogacara philosopher, both these things, what Shavakayana believes and also what Madhyamika believes are two extremes. For according to them, what middle way is, is just consciousness. And how consciousness up operates, it operates according, uh, like it is a continuum of consciousness which is free from the aspect of the perceiver and perceived. Um, okay, I think I should stop here. Uh, I'm sorry if I have made any mistakes. I'm still a student of uh, yoga Zara philosophy. It's a very complex system. And uh, like sometimes when I speak, I some, sometimes there is something back in the mind, my mind and I say something different, so I'm really very sorry for my mistake. <laughs> thank you, thank you for Samisha Kamle's uh, presentation. So now it's Q&A time, and if you have any question, you can raise your hand and I can pass the mic to you. And, okay. Hi. 
Good morning. Uh, I, I don't have much knowledge of what uh, you have said, but I'm a little bit confused over your eye consciousness that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, because I thought that consciousness only come from the mind. Consciousness? No, uh, I mean, when you talk about... Yes. Yeah, but I don't quite understand what is this eye consciousness that you are, oh, you are talking uh, okay, about. Okay, okay. All right, thank uh, you. I assume you are talking about Ale, Ale Vignan, Ale consciousness. I consciousness. Okay. Because uh -huh. you perceive everything is whatever you perceive mm -hmm. and all that it let's say what you see, yes. it actually goes into your brain. And you, and after that after that your your the mind consciousness. So I, I can't see the that I consciousness that you are talking about. Okay. Uh, so I consciousness um when we say that we are seeing something, like on what basis we are saying that we, we see something? Uh, for example, I say, okay, I see this table. So what is the basis for me to uh, say that, okay, I am seeing this table? So when we go into... Uh, everything okay? Yeah. So when we go into the Abhidharma, so they give us an analysis of how we say that... what. I like I I'm able to see this table okay so the the process which is happening is when I say I consciousness arises so I consciousness arises means your I is um, okay to put it in simple terms I would say you are, you are able to see something you are able to make a decision you are able to make a decision that okay you have seen something you, you uh, like if we attribute it some properties it will it would be going in the area of mind consciousness okay so um, that's why i see it as mm -hmm. mind consciousness rather than maybe the concept of i consciousness that you're talking about yes the the concept of i consciousness okay, okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your mind seeing it, you have to have got a conscious to see that. So I consciousness E Y E I. This I faculty I'm talking about. Okay. Hmm. Into your mind. It goes inside into your brain. Okay. Yeah. According to Abhidharma, that uh -huh. is going that consciousness going to the mind is the second step. Is the second step which happens when your I consciousness arises. First, for for you to analyze or for you to make an assumption that. Uh, to add an attribute to this table, that this is a table. To make an, to make that decision, your eye consciousness, your mind consciousness, having the basis of eye consciousness, will make the decision that okay, this is a table. But for your mind consciousness to function, first of all, your eye consciousness has to ha has to arise. Okay, okay, I think I think I get it now. Okay. Yeah, because I'm I'm actually looking from the cognitive psychology. You see. Yes, because yes. cognitive psychology, you, whatever you perceive, whatever you see, mm -hmm. whatever you sense, whatever you touch, actually goes into your brain. All right. Brain. So, yeah. So the brain, to me, after that, it will be the mind consciousness. So when you talk about the I consciousness, I was mm -hmm. a little bit confused. But I think whatever you explain, I, 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 I think I got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry because we are we now we just got so used to speaking this that when uh, like a very um, Mm, how to say a very small section is asked that I just got confused about how I sh how should I explain this to you now <laughs> so it, it's just that like when we even say that okay our ear consciousness arises and when you when our ear consciousness arises when there is a sound and uh, we have a proper functioning ear okay when this two comes in contact ear consciousness arises and when we understand that okay this is the sound which I am perceiving and we attribute some um, 
attribution to what kind of sound is this, then our, eye, our ear consciousness has passed down to our mind consciousness. Okay, so the the uh, the role of attributing some factors or some attributing some properties is done by for sure it's done by mind consciousness but for mind consciousness to come into play it is very necessary that ear consciousness comes in arises first if you do not have a proper functioning ear you, your ear consciousness will not get an object because your ear consciousness will didn't have any object it cannot pass down the object to the eye it's a little bit different. I, if I had some marker or something, I could have drawn it and show to you. But I hope it's making sense now. <laughs> we are here. Okay, I, we are studying Buddhism. Okay, we are studying it at an academic level. But you all, you are here. Maybe you are here because you think like Buddha can give you something worth. Like you know that Buddha. Like why do we, um, why do we pray to Buddha? Do we pray to him as a god? We pray to him because he told us, he gave us, like he gave us, um, how to say, he explained to us what reality is. Okay, so when, this is one part, we are, we, we, we are coming here because we, uh, like, we think that, okay, we will be able to learn Buddha's teaching. So we will get an insight into what reality is. So what reality is, is like this is an aspect which this philosopher has introduced to us. When we are speaking at, uh, when, we are, when we are discussing sutras and all, this is a feature which is not like very unique to Buddhism. Reality, it's very nice, but it is also something which is common. The part which we differentiate is the part of wisdom. Is the part of how we see how the things really exist. What, uh, what we are looking for is, like, we are here because suffering makes sense to us. We, why, why we are suffering? We are suffering because we are not able to see the reality as it is. How we will eradicate the suffering? By seeing the reality as it is. So first of all, if we want to see how reality is, how reality is, we need to find where we are mistaken. If we are adding something on what is, what it is, and if we are removing something of what it is not. Okay, so whether we should go into all these things or not is something I would say from my perspective is how much do you want to take care of your suffering? <laughs> like if you, yes, please. Uh -huh. Basic concept of like you say, yes. uh, uh, basic concept mm -hmm. of Buddhism, I think, is uh, is uh, is fundamental to all. So, can I, from the way you the talk, mm -hmm. does could it be uh, this yoga uh, chara or charavasta is a methodology? Because the basic concept you're talking about uh, consciousness and all this, then you're talking about liberation and everything. So could we, could we classify this school of thought, which is earlier, mm -hmm. is a philosopher that think of a methodology or explanation. Mm -hmm. So basically, the destination is the same. So can we, uh, does it mean that this school, we cannot say, and uh, no, cannot jive in the same level as uh, Theravada or what. So is it just a, a form of method? method and explanation for us to go. So you have different, different, different methods mm -hmm. like Saravastika and all these yes, others, yes, yes. which many of them has yes. gone. Uh -huh. Does it? Okay. So, uh, like... Um, is it a method or is it a school? Method, school... Uh, okay, I would like to put it in this word. Like, this is a way to, to see reality as consciousness only is the interpretation of Buddha's teaching made by this, this, this philosophers. Okay? So it's just like a different form of meditation. Like you got, yes. Uh, According to them, what Buddha was, what the actual intent of Buddha was, Buddha was referring to this. According to the Sarvastivada philosopher, according to Theravada philosopher, according to them, the ultimate intent of Buddha was this. According to Sarvastivada philosopher, they say, no, like we do not find it like this. According to this, according to 
our perspective what buddha's ultimate intent was what he was trying to make uh, clear to us was reality exists in this way and this is the way to liberation so so this is a form of methodology does this school still <laughs> exist do they still exist do they still have followers mm, yes oh, is it okay thank you thank you uh the, do you want me to answer your another question also and, or? uh, uh, can i make a contribution please uh based on the questions that have been asked i think in order to understand this, uh to put into context what you're saying we need to understand the history of buddhism how from the very first teachings of the buddha which is early teachings mm -hmm. then you have the first buddhist council second buddhist council you know uh the teachings of the buddha which actually started from the gangetic plain mm -hmm. uh spread in different parts of india right mm -hmm. uh because teachers have moved to different parts of india and uh, unlike the situation right now where but we are all connected with internet and all that and we can learn from teachers from all over the world um each of these areas have a uh, meditate people who practice the teachings and uh, uh realized teachers who have discovered different aspects of the teachings right and so uh, different schools of buddhism developed in india because they're not really in direct communication with one another for instance when you talk about theravada theravada was actually if you look at the um, uh, the uh, description by uh, 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 you know by by the early uh, schools of buddhism it is actually in the south india and sri lanka so they have developed a uh, basic teachings of the buddha is the same for another truth it for part is the same in across the buddhist teachings but some of these particular things related especially to like abhidhamma and all that they develop uh, developed by different teachers so in the southern part of india which later on uh you know is concentrated in sri lanka which we call the theravada is one of the sc early schools of buddhism and other early schools of buddhism have gone northwest to kashmir and also in pakistan and that is what you call the sabasti bodhins basic teachings core teachings of liberation and all that are the same but when it comes to particular interpretation and explanation different teachers have come up with different explanation and that is why you are having some difficulty because from the sabasti bodhins they are also expanded because uh in the northern part of india which also include pakistan and afghanistan there are many many uh, very, uh well developed teachers of a very high uh you know practice and intellectual ability and there was a lot of also interactions there so you see even the yoga chara schools developing from this um from this area and later on uh, you know the development of the mahayana teachings which has actually benefited a lot from these early schools of of buddhism like the sarvasti bodhins uh, contribution has also enriched mahayana so you need to see this as different different schools developing in different parts of the world in which it, they don't have that kind of interact interaction scholars you know uh, so um, that is why sometimes you have uh, some difficulty in trying to understand one school's interpretation and another school's interpretation so i guess you know uh, in terms of our practice it is good to for us to anchor ourselves in one particular practice so that we don't get confused but if you tend to be more intellectually bent and you like to explore more things then of course there are many resources available you can learn about other schools in the case of tibetan buddhism you see uh, in the case of tibetan buddhism after uh, buddhism went over to tibet uh, there was a great debate at samye monastery whether to follow the chinese uh uh interpretation of buddhism which is really zen that sudden enlightenment or do you follow the indian interpretation so they had a, a debate that lasted for something like three days and uh trisong datsun king trisong datsuns and then they actually decided that uh, let us align ourselves with indian interpretation because the uh, the teachings really came from nalanda and as a result of which tibetan buddhism was actually um, you know benefited from a university that is able to incorporate different aspects of buddhism throughout the history of buddhism early buddhism right up to the tantric tradition right so in the case of tibetan buddhism it actually encompasses a wide range of uh, various elements and when there are certain kinds of uh, controversies or uh, certain things that you cannot agree the university uh, you know was able to try to try to um, uh align some of the teachings so in a sense that in the tibetan teachings uh, you have contained the whole spectrum of it whereas when it goes to china china does not have the benefit of nalanda 
So different parts of China develop different aspects of Buddhism, and sometimes they even concentrate the entire teachings of Buddhism into one particular sutra. So, and then many of these early schools of Buddhism has actually disappeared. Uh, disappeared because of historical reasons. So uh, the early school of Buddhism that is widely practiced now will be the Theravada. Savasthi was very, very influential in northeastern India, but you know what happened to Kashmir and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And so uh, I do not know how many people in the world right now are actually practicing Savasthi as a pure form. But you have expects of Savasthi Vardens within the Mahayana teachings. I think I agree with uh, Brother Victor Wee here. I think this is a time of integration and having a holistic view of ancient Buddhism and then as well to integrate and to practice in our daily life as a modern Buddhist. Like, um, like you mentioned just now, in Tibetan Buddhism, especially in Gelupa tradition, they do have this kind of intellectual uh, debate or studies uh, on, the, on the four philosophical, philosophical schools of Buddhism. And they do... We do integrate well, especially the yoga chara view, you know, in our visualization and meditative practice. So this is a very good example of um, integrating the practicality and the intellectualism of of both sides, lah. I think, yeah, the theory sides and the practic practical side we can integrate as a modern Buddhist. I think it's time for us to do this. Yeah, we don't lack of information. We have a lot of information nowadays, but it's time for us to integrate them and uh, to put them into the practice. Lah. Okay, this is my view. And also, in, we talk about, um, like say, like if you, if you say, are using badminton as an as a example, okay? If you want to become a professional, if you learn how to play badminton, right? Then you can learn from your guru or school, particular school of, of badminton. But when you really enter into a professionalism of badminton, probably you need to study some terminology of badminton. Yeah, like what is how smash, what is, what is draw, and what is smash, and all these things. So I think, in other words, for us as the common Buddhists, it's also important for us to understand, to delve into the depth of the uh, Greek philosophies of Buddhism, like Yogacara, Madhyamika. Yeah, I think it's, we integrate both these two. It's good for us, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Kamala, you have anything to add? Lastly, uh, a question. Do you want to answer the question? I think it's a question. No. Why you select this? One, do you want to learn the Vachara? Oh. How relevant is it to the present day? Present day. Um, I. Yes. Does. Sorry, the commentary which I'm working over is a yoga chara commentary, so it's a part of my study, and also something which interests me. Yep. So, uh, okay. okay. Now we invite uh, Samisha Meshum to uh, give her sharing on the title of. Uh, um, Introduction to Savasivasta and the beginning of Mahayana. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say that uh, I would like to apologize because the topic which I have given to me, it's a very broad topic. And introduction to Sarvastivada, it's, it's, it's itself very broad. And then beginning of Mahayana, it itself requires a um, large amount of, how to say, uh, a specific amount of time to explain that. So I will be just introduce, introducing very br briefly, so it will be not a very uh, uh, deep, because it, I say that it's very broad and it's required a uh, specific amount of time. So let's start from the um, uh, introduction to Sarvastivada, uh, which um, started uh, probably around um, a third century BCE. Uh, so the term Sarvastivada, Sorry. Okay. So, Sarvastivada is an Abhidharmic school. Okay. So, like we have, um, we we have some idea that 
uh, after Buddha's uh, Mahaparinirvana, we have got so many schools. Uh, like uh, the two major schools uh, occurred in the Second Buddhist Council, which is uh, Maha Sankhika and uh, Stavid Nikaya. Mahasavri Nikaya. So we have got these two. And from these two major schools, we have uh, Nikaya. We have got so many um, uh, division of uh, Buddhist schools, which uh, we have in um, like 15 schools, more than that also. So one of them is Sar Sarvastivada. And Sarvastivada is Abhidharmic uh, school. Uh, the term Sarvastivada means, it's a Sanskrit word, Sarvam Asti. And Vada, Vada is a position or Siddhanta or um, theory. So Sarvam means all and Asti means exist. So all exist. So their basic philosophical view is everything, all the entities exist in three times, past, present, and future. So this is their main philosophical view. Okay, uh, this is how they perceive the reality that okay, everything happens in this um, 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 in this uh, uh, times, like all the entities. So before uh, saying me, okay, that uh, Sarvastivada has this view, I would like to explain that uh, what the entities means. What are the entities that they believe that they exist? So entities are means that those which have uh, which possess a self characteristic so lakshana so every entity has a certain a specific uh, defining trait through which they are recognizable okay to them we call entities um, okay so as uh, theravada abhidharma school they have seven treatises in same way in number, uh, Sarvastivada school also they have seven treatises, but individual text differs considerably, so it's not very same. So the seventh Jnana Prasthana, uh, it's one of the last uh, text of the Sarvastivada school, which is uh, the commentary uh, is the Mahavibhasha Shastra from which the Vibhashika school emerged. So, okay, we will not go in that. So uh, the Sarvastivadin present a number of arguments in support of the existence of these three times. Uh, to explain this, uh, there are four uh, which uh, briefly I will say to you, which is a testimony. They believe that, okay, Bhagavan Buddha has said in certain sutras that uh, past, present, and future entities, they existed, and that's how they function, because if they were existent, and that's how the shravakas or the meditators, they have got in their meditation that, okay, these are the things which should be abandoned. And the second is consciousness needs a presently existent object. So according to them, like Samiksha explained uh, from the Yogacara perspective, we do not need any object. It's a con consciousness itself function, and uh, it doesn't need external object. But for the Sarvastivadins, they believe in real ex entities. They need uh, object, external object, uh, to function. So that's how consciousness arises for them. And the third is karmic responsibility. Uh, and the fourth is three times as mutually interdependent. So past, present, and future, they are not uh, um, separate, but they are mutually working together. So when they say that, okay, some entities present in the uh, present uh, in past, so they have certain connection with the present and also to the future. So they are not completely uh, distinct. So we cannot make sense of them. Uh, sense of them. So according to them, they are interconnected. Okay. Okay, so now the main question the Sarvastivadins might have, or someone might ask to them, okay, that uh, past entities exist, 
present uh, entities exist, future entities exist. Okay, but only present present entities have that um, efficacy or um, capacity to work, or how to say, it. they have that uh, ability to function. For example, if there is a um, water, so if the glass of water is there, so that only quench my thirst. If I think, okay, in past the water existed and just thinking of that wouldn't able to uh, quench my thirst. So, okay, how do they uh, uh, encounter uh, this, um, how do they answer this uh, uh, type of um, question? So, according to them, uh, the present glass of water, for example, let's say a present glass of water quench thirst, yet past or future water cannot. Okay, that's true. The Sarvastivadi accounts for this by the theory of efficacy. So, they have this theory to, um, to counter this uh, or to respond to this question that, okay, there is a, in Sanskrit we call karitra, it's efficacy. Only present entities have that efficacy to function, but it doesn't mean that the past and future doesn't exist. And they have the capacity to function in present, that's how the present ent entities function, that's how the entities function for them. So saying that all the entities uh, exist past, present, and future, but only the entities which have present efficacy to function, only they can perform in the present moment. So that's how, and, and that happens because of the efficacy. That happens because of the karitra, okay? So this is the particular theory they have, how entities um, uh, function in present moment. Okay, then again one question might ask, okay then, uh, the things, uh, the entities which, uh, okay, e efficaciousness is the um, uh, um, mark that the uh, uh, entities can function, but then there are so many entities uh, present, so how about uh, uh, they give an example that, okay, there is a person and there is a dark room, in this situation, the person has an eye, but he couldn't able to see. It's a dark room. So entities uh, uh, like present in the moment, but the person couldn't able to see. Then how does this function? How, according to them, when they say that the past, present, and future entities is uh, present, then in this situation, what's happening? So then Sarvasti Valin say that, and there are various things uh, we can mean by efficacy, and as long as some of these obtain, the object can be considered as existence. So the p person in the dark room cannot see, uh, so their eye temporarily lack the capacity. So because their eye temporarily lack the capacity of to, to see the visible object, so, and that's why there is no, nothing, uh, um, how to say, there are no uh, possibility or uh, things to help to generate the visual impression. So yet their visual system still exists, but it is efficacious in bringing about its own successor moments. So each moment of the visual system produces the next. So. Hence, the visual system persists during the period of darkness, and we will see when the light is switched back, then the consciousness will be back. So it's about the capacity of the, um, so it's only about the capacity of, it's a temporarily lack of capacity of eye, uh, of the visual impressions. Okay. There are some more um, views that uh, there are some more person who say that, uh, who has a view that everything exists. So there are main four um, uh, masters who has a certain view uh, or they have certain theory that, okay, for them, the Sarva Asti means in different way.
Okay, so this is the one thing which is uh, uh, very vital to Sarvasti Vada Abhidharma. And the second, uh, the causation plays a central role in uh, Sarvasti Vada Abhidharma. In fact, the school was also known by the Hetu Vada, the theory of causes. So the intrinsic nature, Swabhava, of the ultimately existent dharmas is causally produced. As I said that, okay, past, present and future, they are interconnected. And the ability to be causally efficacious is what the Sarvastivadin considered to be the mark of the existence. So for them, the entities which are capable of functioning, they function at the moment. And past and present, uh, past and future entities, though devoid of karitra, devoid of um, unability to function, still exist because they are causally um, able to function in being able to function as object of mental cognition of past and future entity, future time. So causation, causation and the ability, the samarthya, uh, as to produce effects, therefore, stands at the very uh, center of the Sarvastivada ontology. If we cannot uh, show the something causally active, we cannot show that it exists at all. So for them, if, we, if one couldn't able to show that they are causally uh, function, then the existence of those entities are... Uh, it's, it's very difficult to um, say that those, in, those, those things exist. So as we have, uh, okay, uh, Sarvasti Vadins came up with the idea that, okay, reflected in the school's name Sarvasti Vada, the doctrine that everything exists. So they claim that dharmas do not arise from non-existent uh, future, uh, become existent, and then as they become past, vanish into non-existence again. Rather, according to them, dharmas exist at three times. Also use the term swabhava. Swabhava means uh, own uh, own nature to denote a constant essence persisting uh, uh, through the three times, which is the basis of differentiating between uh, between things. But while past and present of, um, would have been the same swabhava, only the present entity or present thing uh, would have the uh, capacity, uh, property produced by causes and conditions. Okay, I will leave this part. Okay, so what are the things which they consider are real existence? And when we study Yogacara and Madhyamaka, before that, it's required to study Sarvastivada, Abhidharma, and uh, Sautrantika. So what are the things which they, uh, um, which they think that, OK, these are the real uh, entities? So there are five uh, real uh, things which call Panchavastu in, uh, in uh, Sanskrit. OK, those five entities, uh, five real uh, uh, group of uh, entities are form, um, form, uh, rup, chitta, uh, chaitya, uh, samskara, and asamskrita dharmas. So form includes uh, the 11 types of entities, uh, like um, visible form, and then avidnapti dharmas, and uh, the four rupas, and then upadaya rupas, and mind. Uh, chaitya and chitta viprakta samskara are the uh, main um, um, factor of this uh, school and then unproduced things. So according to Sarvastivada Abhidharma, they believe that there are three dharmas which are not produced. So for them, so this is only for the uh, Sarvastivada school, not accepted by any other schools. So for them, the space and two types of cessation are only uh, unconditioned entities which, which exist. So it's just for the information that, okay, this is the main 
uh, thing that only Sarvastivada upholds. Mm, okay, so far any question you all have? Because if not, then I will move to the my second broad topic, which is the beginning of Mahayana, which is I will explain very shortly. So, so far, if anyone has any question. Okay. So, beginning of Mahayana, historically, it is said that it started from uh, the first century, but it's a very debatable topic actually, beginning of Mahayana, because the Buddha's teaching has been interpreted very differently by many schools, okay? But we broadly categorize them uh, by saying uh, Shravaka school and Mahayana school. So Shravaka school includes all the uh, schools uh, you know, from Sanskrit tradition, from Pali tradition, and everything. Mahayana schools only include Yogacara and Madhyamaka. So, it is said that um, from the Mahayana um, account that there are three types of Dharma Chakra Pravartana. So the teachings which Shravaka school has is given in the first Dharma Chakra Pravartana. So which is in the Rajakriha. Uh, uh, when Buddha was here, like Shakyamuni Buddha has given that uh, first Dharma Chakra Pravartana and the uh, which includes the teaching of four noble truths, eight noble fold path, eight fold noble path, and these are the things which includes in first uh, Dharma Chakra Pavartana. The second and third includes the Pradnya Paramita Sutras and the um, uh, mind only schools. So uh, it's like the um, uh, Lankavatara Sutra and all. So these uh, sutras include in these uh, two Dharma Chakra Pavartana um, uh, teachings. Mahayana, how to say, it's very debatable, so I thought no, not to speak so much about this, but okay. The main thing, uh, the main factors of a um, Mahayana school is that the Bodhisattva concept, the param, Pradnya Paramita, uh, uh, the emphasis, more emphasis on Pradnya Paramita, and um, Upaya Kaushalya. So these are some of the factors of Mahayana schools. And also is that uh, the beings who works for the sentient, the, all the uh, sentient beings and whose ultimate aim is to uh, not attain nirvana only, but attain Buddhahood. Because Buddhahood has that capacity to help number of sentient beings. It doesn't restrict a small amount of sentient beings as we have a lot. So it's a mode of practices like Mahayana, um, um, Shravaka schools, and uh, like like the brother, the sir, he explained that these are the uh, the way of practices. The one uh, which has the inclinations to practice. We have certain karmas to uh, uh, incline to certain schools and practices. So Mahayana is lead to the complete Buddhahood. The one who practices Mahayana has the intention of uh, uh, complete, to reach an, uh, to the complete Buddhahood. And there is a reason why this Mahayana called Mahayana. It's not uh, coming from nowhere and they call themselves Mahayana. So there are seven reasons why this school is called Mahayana. Okay, so one last thing I will say that when we differentiate between uh, the yanas, like, okay, this is um, Shavakayana or this is Hinayana, this is Mahayana. So it's not just because their philosophical views are different. It's because their uh, ultimate aim is different. So they differ in terms of their ultimate aim. So. One's aim is to attain nirvana, to liberation, and this other's uh, ultimate aim is to attain complete Buddhahood. So it's just a matter of their uh, aim, not just because their philosophical views are different. It's just a method, it's just a mode of practices that they are differ in, okay? But what makes 
this division that um, that this is yana and this is another yana it's because ultimately uh, one and only depending on their aim their final aim their ultimate aim what they wanted to achieve and because um, when i say this i differ what is nirvana and what is buddhahood uh, so there is a, 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 a distinction between uh, what we call liberation and what you call buddhahood so liberation is uh, the destruction of all the defilements defilements in terms of our afflictions and uh, like lobha moha dosha like we all know and complete uh, buddhahood differs only with the one thing and which is a very uh, considerable which is omniscience so omniscience and uh, liberation these two things when come uh, together then one can attain the uh, ultimate uh, buddhahood the samyak sambuddha which we call uh, samyak uh, perfectly uh, complete uh, state of buddhahood and so this is the aim of mahayana practitioners and other practitioners they have the aim of just liberation which is also very difficult but as i said that's how this yanas differs so when we say in when we speak about in terms of yanas so we have to keep in mind that it's not just because they are differing in in, in terms of philosophical views and we are calling them but uh, it's just their ultimate aim okay so this is uh, this much i have to say i have restrict myself to say too much because i afraid that this topic was very broad and i am not that capable of explaining this much so i know i haven't done the justice to this topic but okay briefly i have tried myself my best to explain this to you so if you have any questions so i can i can try to answer them okay testing 1 2 3 thank you sister for the uh, brief sharing of the mahayana um actually the um, different between mahayana and theravadians a lot of the cultivator will find it a bit difficult to comprehend in some way or others and your briefing do give me some insight so i thank you for it and the other speaker on the yoga chara which is not a easy topic to uh understand because it's consciousness only <laughs> because consciousness you talk about the six consciousness seven consciousness and eight consciousness it's not easy one really devote themselves into the true cultivation you will be able to comprehend if not it's quite difficult so my question that i want to ask or share um i can understand why people are quite um, find it difficult to differentiate between liberation when i say liberation is self liberation and of course you try to liberate those that is around you and the mahayana expect of um perfections and buddhahood that is the samasam buddha um i just want to ask this the question is the different between self liberations and others that is around you which is very much talk about in the Taravadian teaching and to liberate sentient beings and buddhahood is very much in the mahayana tradition and so is the tibetan tradition i don't know whether it is right for me to say that one's nature or one's person i use nature because ours is not form and mind is nature 
depend very much on one's nature exposed to the kind of uh, teaching or perfections. Because some of us are fortunate to have affinity with great gurus, gurus or teachers that can give us the different kind of exposure that the early Yogacara or the Tibetan teachers because most of them they talk about liberating oneself, liberating sentient beings and to have Buddhahood. So for the Theravadian it's more on self-liberations and liberating others and become Arahanto. So my question is is it because of the exposure that the nature is exposed to and the wow they have made many, many lifetimes that is deeply embedded in their alaya consciousness? Because you do talk about consciousness which is the, the relinking consciousness, life after life, we, that was help. So that is the question that I want to ask you. Uh, both of you, because both of you are in this kind of teaching that you are exposed to, so kindly enlighten the audience here. Okay, thank you. That's my question. I think it depends more on our karma, because like in front of you, there are three types of uh, teachings available, okay? Like uh, uh, Theravada, uh, Theravada Bidharma, Saravastivada Bidharma, Yoga Chara, Madhyamaka. Which view attracts you more? Which view you are convinced with? What do you think, uh, like, okay, this is what the reality is, and this is um, taking me more near to the Buddha. And uh, because, our aim is to attain nirvana, ultimate happiness, ultimate uh, liberation. We want to uh, want us in that situation where we can feel that ultimate happiness. So how? Like it's very far from us, very far, because we are afflicted people. We have a lot of defilements and all. So to remove this, we have to go step by step. Okay, so what path attracts me more? Is it that the Shravaka uh, path attracts me more or the Mahayana path? Is that um, according to me or my understanding, it's more or less depends on our karmic uh, uh, inclinations uh, that to which teachings we attract and then the accumulation of merit and then accumulation of wisdom, the extent uh, uh, the extension of these two we have, and according to them, we we make our way to li liberation or to the ultimate Buddhahood. So it's a matter of um, our merits and our wisdom. Yeah, that I can say. Please. Um, I'd like to make a contribution as well uh, for uh, the discussion. Please. I think most people are under the impression that in the case of Mahayana Buddhism, you always talk about liberation as a, uh, from a bodhisattva. You get a enlightenment and you uh, help to liberate all beings. And in the case of Theravada Buddhism, it's only the matter of attaining arahanship through the practice of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, but I don't think that's a correct representation of what the Theravada tradition represents. In Theravada Buddhism, there are three paths to getting liberation. One is what you call the Shravakayana. Shravakayana means you are like a listener, you listen to the teachings of the Buddha, and through the practice of, the uh, based on the instructions given by the Buddha, you gain enlightenment. And I do know that in the Theravada tradition, that has been promoted heavily. But there are two other ways of getting liberation. One is the uh, Pacheka, Buddha, Yana, that is to become self-enlightened, but you do not have the full accomplishment of being able to enlighten other beings 
uh, that crosses time and space. So that's a Pachika Yana. And uh, so you can actually become a Pachika Buddha, which is also going through this cultivation, much more lifetimes that you have to end, uh, endure, uh, overcome your impurities and defilements, and perfect your virtues, your parameters, for you to become a Pachika Buddha. And of course, the crowning glory will be the Samasam Buddhahood, which is also present in the Theravada tradition. And in fact, within the Theravada tradition, there are many monks uh, that are also aspiring to be a Samasam Buddha. And so therefore, in the Theravada tradition, you have the four stages of sainthood. And so if a, if a person practices uh, the path and gained uh, sainthood, he would only stop at the third stage of sainthood because he would not want to come out to the state of Arahant uh, in which he doesn't get reborn again. Because he wants to continue being reborn to cultivate his virtues so that one day he can be a Samasam Buddha. So it is not correct to say that the, uh, that the Theravada traditions only talk about Shravakayana because the, tr the three paths are available and also encouraged within the Theravada tradition. The difference is that within the Theravada tradition, for you to be a Samasam Buddha, you have to go through many kalpas, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the history or, or, or the birth stories of, uh, of Gautama Buddha himself. He got the confirmation of becoming a Bodhisattva during the time of Buddha Dipankara, which is a fourth Buddha within the uh, ranking of, uh, within the listing of Buddhas, 28 Buddhas within in the Theravada tradition. And he became the 28th Buddha. So he went through many, 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 many lifetimes in order to perfect himself, right? So which means that the highest ideal, of course, in all Buddhist tradition is to become a Samasam Buddha. But that is, if you feel that you have the accomplishment and you have the determination to become the fully enlightened Buddha, you are prepared to go through many more lifetimes in order to be liberated. But many others who do not feel that they have the accomplishment or the ability, they're quite happy uh, to be liberated under the Shravakayana, right? So, of course, when you look at this from this perspective, of course, the highest ideal is to be a Samasam Buddha. So, in the Mahayana tradition, they have encouraged people to take out the Bodhisattva role. But actually, when you want to take that Bodhisattva role, you must be prepared to go through so many more lifestyles in order to perfect yourself, so that one day you can become a big fairy in which other beings can get onto your fairy for you to ferry them across to the other shore, which is a very, very difficult thing. But of course, in terms of achievements, that is the highest in all Buddhist traditions we recognize that. So we should not belittle any of the traditions, although in some other, you know, sometimes schools of Buddhism, sometimes through this dialogue and debate, they think that, of course, becoming the ultimate Buddha is, is the highest and the others are not really such a worthy path. I don't think we should look at that. It actually depends on you as a person in terms of your practice. How much do you want to carry on your shoulder? Do you want to find liberation as quickly as possible? Especially after having experienced uh, the unsatisfactoriness of life and you feel that like, this is it. Uh, this is it. And uh, I do not want uh, to pro prolong the process anymore. Or you feel that your compassion is so great that you are prepared to undertake the path of a bodhisattva. And that is recognized in all traditions of Buddhism. That is recognized as the highest. Okay? So maybe this is as a point of a distinction so that we can actually understand what it means. Of course, in some schools of Mahayana Buddhism, they recognize that to become a Samasam Buddha is actually so difficult. So they say that why don't you change the name of Amitabha Buddha? So that you will be born in pure land and there you receive the instructions from the Buddha himself, and then you get enlightened from that. So that you don't have to go through so many rounds of rebirth, through many Mahakalpas, in order to become a Samasam Buddha. Okay, thank you. As a Buddhist, uh, initially, uh, I also gathered these uh, things about Theravada and Mahayana, about that is a small waker and a big waker. When I actually see, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not just that Theravada is a small waker or Mahayana is a big waker. Similarly, I've uh, noticed our late chief is doing a lot of missionary work 
and missionary work are actually helping people to see the Dharma, to get enlightenment. And that is the uh, 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 work of a uh, uh, Buddhist a work of Mahayanis. So I start to also gather, like uh, 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 Tato Sri mentioned, you know, uh, we, our distinction is not about Theravada means small acre, but actually the works they are doing. Similarly, BGF are doing, you know, like now, uh, giving, sharing. This, this is our work, which is uh, with big compassion, with big heart. The virtues are very big because uh, the purpose is to make more people see the Dharma to achieve enlightenment. That is what, to me, I see as a, a, a work of a, a so-called Mahayana. You know? So the distinction is not basically by name, by virtue of what we do uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we having that kind of, although it's small, but still that is the beginning, a seed of compassion that we wish others to also able to prosper and see the Dharma to achieve uh, liberation and enlightenment. Uh, so um, a lot of times in the early, my view was that when they dress that way or when they have uh, that kind of uh, 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 what they call uh, recitation of certain sutra, that is uh, considered a Mahayana. Uh, or when you recite uh, you know, these suttas and you dress, you know, which is a Theravadian monk, uh, that is a, a Theravada. So uh, I think I really understand this. We break away from all that. Uh, is actually uh, what we do. Uh, basically, like PGR, what they are doing is very maha. You know, they're having, uh, always having a thought or having a place that is suitable so that we are able to propagate the Dharma. That, that is what uh, it means by maha. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, just a, a personal sharing. You know, I'm, I'm actually very glad that I happened to come here. Uh, I, I, I took a train 5 a.m. from uh, Ipoh, not to say purposely to come here, but I want to see how, how BGF looks like. No, I, I haven't been here. It's my first time here. So I actually Google and I, I mean, I look into my Facebook. I say, oh, yeah, there's a forum today. Okay, I come. And, uh, and it so happened because uh, my second son is just staying somewhere, what, Kantara residence. So afterwards, I can even walk back. Yeah. So, so it, it, actually, it actually falls into place, you know. Uh, I couldn't take, I, I wanted to attend something, 11 something uh, train. There was no more, you know. The, the only available is 5 a.m. So I have to get out for, for something. So, so I was thinking, oh, good. I, have, uh, I can spend my, my time here, uh, my beneficial time, all right. So I'm glad I actually came and I managed to meet even Brother Chi Singh in person here and even uh, uh, Dr. Sri Victor B, which I've seen the uh, first time was in Gladian, you remember? Gladian 11. Yeah, so all you know, I, I, I want to say that I'm very, very happy uh, to be able to, to step into here and to listen to the talk here. And I, I want to say that my, pers my personal experience is that, you know, after listening to your, the, the Theravada school or Mahayana or whatever, the, you know, the... I, I still can't pronounce it, what Chara, Chara thing. All right, yeah, okay. So I, because I'm, I, I, I would say that I'm a Buddhist, but I, I'm still learning. I would use the word, I'm still learning. And when I, sometimes I go for Dharma talk, uh, even in Ipo, you know, Chinaraj and all that, I, I pose this question, like what uh, Dr. Sri Victor V said, you, you, it takes many, many, many years of, of Rebirth to become uh, enlightened or so-called awakening and all that. So, when when I when I asked, you know, uh, Bante, I say, uh, uh, no, there was a question to pose to me that uh, you all can be enlightened straight away and all that. No, I say, I, because I feel that in this life I'm still not a, a good, a better person in this sense. I I say I need to have a I, I prefer a better rebirth, you know, or maybe to contribute more or to even. You know, to learn more about Buddhism. So I say, uh, then uh, the question was, uh, what, what, do you, what do you want? I said, I want a next life, uh, a better rebirth. 
He said, why don't you straight away uh, like think of enlightenment, Buddhahood? So I said, until now, I still keep to that concept that I need a better rebirth. Because like you see, to, to become a Buddha, you take so long. You know? so, so that's my just a personal sharing that I, I, I don't know. I still feel that I, I need a better rebirth in this sense to be so in, the ne- in my next life. Yeah, not not to say not not like Bante said. Why don't you aim for enlighten, enlightenment straight away? All right, okay. Uh, a bit sideline from here, but I, this is my sharing. Thank you. So, with my uh, little understanding, I would just like to address uh, Sir has said. So uh, when we talk about Theravada or Shavakyana or Bodhisattva or Bodhisattvayana, like we, uh, when we say that uh, a person is aimed at liberation and a person is aimed at uh, becoming a Bodhisattva or complete Buddhahood, so we are not saying that this person who is aiming at liberation, apart from his own liberation, he will not do anything else. Like he will not help any other person at all. This is not the case. So for sure, a person who is aiming at liberation can do all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, like very wholesome activities, like conducting all these seminars, conducting, uh, helping people in highest possible ways. So the difference where the difference lies between when you are doing a when you are doing no matter what kind of act it is uh, for sure it should be a wholesome act but whether it is a small wholesome act or it is a big wholesome act what are we aimed at where are we dedicating our merits so the difference lies there so when we are talking about shavakayana so we don't mean to say that that they are not contributing anything for other people shavakayana the listener's vehicle, but when, uh, as what our t- professor has taught us, it, when we look back to the etymology of what Shravaka is, so it's not only one who hears and attains liberation, but also one who makes other people listen to dharma. So it's, it's like, it's, it, it was never meant that he, was, he will just attain his liberation and then he doesn't have to do anything else. We have like many, many, many examples in the suttas, like how... Uh, great arhans has helped other beings for getting liberations. So the uh, what I'm trying to say here is, no matter what our act is, uh, for sure wholesome act, the difference lies in where we are dedicating our merits. What is our aim? Are we aiming at liberation or are we aiming at Buddhahood? So as sir has explained, the um, uh, sir sitting back. So if we are liber, if we are Attaining at liberation, it's for sure very nice. But if we are aiming at Buddhahood, so it's not like then uh, it's a comparative term. So Buddhahood is obviously higher than the liberation. The aim of uh, attaining Buddhahood is obviously higher than attaining liberation. So it's no way looking down towards for one who is who wants to attain liberation for oneself. So it's a great task to pacify one's affliction and. Uh, Yes, one more point uh, which I would like to address, uh, which this uh, this one sitting back uh, said about uh, Theravada uh, having a way to practice Bodhisattva path. So uh, um, I'm not sure like whether I've heard of it, but when for sure when we talk about Theravada, we were, we are practicing about a vinaya lineage. So then when we are um, like Sarvastivada, although we have a philosophical system of Sarvastivada, but we also have a Sarvastivada Vinaya lineage. So a person can have an ordination in that lineage and then take up a Bodhisattva path. So it's completely, see our ordination of lineage, uh, lineage, lineage of ordination, ordination of lineage. Okay. <laughs> so our lineage of ordination uh, could be any like whether it is whether it could be theravada whether it could be sarvastivada or, or any other like chinese they have dharma guptika dharma guptika lineage but our mode of practice whether it would be a shavakayana or bodhisattvayana is is a second choice which we will make later later means whenever but it's a second choice 
so our ordination lineage and our mode of practice which leads to what uh, what we are aiming at so these two are a uh, little different points yeah. yeah for example um tibetans they follow sarvastivada vinaya lineage Although they don't have a view of uh, Sarvasti Vadin that everything exists, although they're followers of the Madhyamaka and Yogacara, but still they ordain in Sarvasti Vada lineage. So that's how um, lineage doesn't matter, but uh, mode of practice is most important. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask something. Actually, I used to talk to, I, I don't know anyone of you remember uh, Verbo uh, Abiyana? You know, we used to joke with him, you know. He asked me, what yana you belong to? Are you uh, Theravada or Mahayana or Vajrayana? I say, I'm Flexiana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always flexible. You know, as Malaysian, we, you know, we are always flexible, you know. We drink tetare as Malay food and we eat nasi lemak, you know. We eat pao and then chichong fan. And then night, we enjoy Indian food again in Little India, okay, in Brickfield. So I think the, the open heart, heartedness and open-mindedness is very important here. And also, as Tien An Hat said, you know, attachment to any form, even attachment to our own school as the best, attachment to our own Buddhist view as the purest, this is also a subtle attachment that we need to let go of. Yeah, I think, uh, like for example, uh, Malay like to eat food by using hand, and we use Chinese use chopsticks, and uh, Westerners or Norman, modern people use fork and spoon. So, we, which are the best way to eat food? Which one? It depends on the food and depends on our mood also, right? Sometimes we use hand, sometimes we use fork and spoon, sometimes we use chopsticks. You know, when we eat with our grandfathers and mothers. So it depends. Yeah, the answer is it depends and it depends. And we are not attached to the form, right? And then we talk about a lot of names and labels today like Theravada, Mahayana, or Vajrayana, or Savasivasta, or Yogacara, Madhyamika. I think, I think one thing we need to remind ourselves is that this name, does it help us to awaken? If it helps, then you use it. But if it blocks us from getting nearer to reality or truth, then we must well uh, liberate ourselves from that as well. Yeah. Because that can, that, this kind of subtle attachment can block us from seeing the reality, as I say. So, a uh, few, three anas, one dharma. I hope we can become a big happy family, as long as you're Buddhist. I mean, sometimes people also say, Buddha is not a Buddhist, yeah? And Jesus is not a Christian. And um, Muhammad, if you're not allowed to say, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not a Muslim, okay? So, but we are so busy and so struggle to try our very best to become a good Buddhist, that's kind of thing, you know? But actually, our aim is to become Samyasam Buddha or to at least deliver ourselves from this kind of bondage, the bondage of names and forms. Yeah. Okay, I think we end here, right, Bobby? Yeah. Thank you to both Samisha Kamli and Samisha Mishra for their quick sharings and please give a round of applause to them.